Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Nightlight. A reminder that you are never alone. I hope everyone is off to a great start to the week. Is there any better way to get into the Halloween Halloween season than talking about the legendary one season show Cole Shack the Night Stalker. It is uh directly attributable for my career in media uh but we do have a real uh media personality and professor with us tonight. He is Kendall Phillips. He is a professor of communications and rhetorical studies at Syracuse University. He also just published Kolshak the Night Stalker. He has also written horror films and American culture, dark directors, Romero, Craven and Carpenter, A Place of Darkness, uh, I think all these books are uh, perfect for tonight. Um, and I think that's why you know, Kendall already has an invitation to come back with a, a lineup like that. So, uh, hi, Kendall. How are you doing? I'm great, Mark. Thank you. And I love having an invitation before I've started because, you know, who, this may get, you may have to rescind that invitation before the <laughs> evening is done. But, no. Uh, and this is, yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Uh, and, of course, you know, with the end of October, you know, it, it is creepy season, so it is definitely my time of year. So thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it, perfect uh, timing uh, for for having you tonight. I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, tonight's show. And uh, – I really did enjoy your Coal Shack. Um, I, 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 where, where can people get it? Uh, uh, just start the show off with a shameless early plug. I love a shameless early plug. Yeah, so the book is Coal Shack, The Night Stalker. Uh, it is published by Wayne State University Press as part of uh, they have a series called TV Milestones, so they're fairly short, relatively cheap books about sort of pivotal uh, shows in the history of TV, so shows like The Honeymooners or MASH or I Love Lucy, uh, and so it was a real honor to get Kolchak, the Night Stalker, into that uh, mix, uh, and they can get that at the Wayne State University Press uh, website or on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any place books are sold. So please, uh, if, you're, if you're loving horror television, track down this book and, and get a look at the uh, kind of the great-grandfather of horror television. Okay. And, um, you, you know, you, you just mentioned uh, MASH, and, you know, we were just talking right before the show started about uh, Jamie Farr. You know, we, you know <laughs> I think we're going to be working in a bunch of – all these other characters, Tom Bosley from Happy Days, and yeah, you know, so you know, we're I think we're is going to kind of cover a little 
little bit of uh, all these uh, different shows tonight, and and uh, yeah, you have your own show on NPR. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that one too? Oh, sure. Thanks. Yeah. So I host a little show uh, called uh, Pop Life. It's uh, produced by WAER. It goes out through National Public Radio. Uh, it is uh, it's a pop culture web uh, or a podcast, but it's really trying to get underneath the surface. So we try to have guests. Uh, we recently had uh, the people behind relaunching Cream Magazine, that kind of iconic 1970s uh, mm-hmm. rock mag. Uh, th- right. That is back. So we talked to them. We talked to the curator of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We've talked to people at Sundance Film Festival. So really our job in pop life is to kind of get to the people who can talk to us about not just what's happening in pop culture, but a little bit of why it's happening. So uh, people should look us up. We're on uh, – you can find us. if you just I'd say just Google Pop Life NPR. You'll find us. Give us a listen. And we actually just had – I'll give a quick plug – um, our Halloween episode, uh, which w- is with an amazing author, uh, best-selling author, award-winning Paul Tremblay, uh, who has a new book called The Paul Bearers Club that's amazing, but also one of his earlier novels called A Cabin at the End of the World uh, is being adapted uh, to a, as, as a major motion picture by M. Night Shyamalan, and the, the film will be called Knock at the Cabin. Uh, and it stars David Bautista, so this is kind of a big budget film. Uh, so if you want to hear more about like horror novels and writing and what it's like to have your novel turned into a motion picture, please check out that uh, check out that episode. Paul was really an amazing guest. So. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, so since so, since you were just talking about. Uh, an upcoming movie, uh, you know, maybe you should. Start with the cultural uh, background and some of the movies leading up to the two TV movies and you know, eventually the uh, TV series. But uh, you know, you, uh, you touch on uh, like Rosemary's Baby and The Godfather, uh, all, all the uh, Clockwork Orange. You, you, know, you have a bunch of stuff coming on that uh, late uh, 60s, early 70s period that pretty uh, cutting edge. Yeah, it's 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 a fascinating period. You know, I have called and, and others have agreed that that period from about 1968 until about 1982 can be thought of as a kind of second golden age for horror. Like the first golden age is starting in 1931 with Dracula and Frankenstein, which are kind of the first Mm -hmm. kind of official horror films. And you get that whole Universal Monsters period. Then you get this period that you're talking about, Mark, and you're exactly right. This period where, you know, the studios have started pulling back. So there's a lot more independent filmmaking. Uh, The production code is gone. Now we're in the rating system. There's less official kind of governmental censorship. So kind of the the, the all – no holds are barred at this point. Like it's it's a free-for-all out there. And really starting in 68, and I think it's – you're right. There are two films that really open the door for this era. One is the big-budget film Rosemary's Baby, uh, which is a, a huge box office success. Um, you know, up for Oscars, gets a lot of attention, but a very kind of bleak, shocking film. Spoiler alert, by the end of it, Rosemary uh, gives birth to Satan, and she decides to keep Satan. So it's like, it's not a happy ending, right? It's sort of the end of the world ending. Um, the other film that I actually think is, is maybe arguably a little more important uh, is a much different film. It is a low budget film made by a group of friends in Pittsburgh who had been doing kind of industrial films, commercials, uh, George Romero. The film is called, everyone knows, Night of the Living Dead. Uh, And this is a film that really does, uh, with less budget and a lot less promotion and a lot more slowly, but it really does change the tone for American filmmaking. And so you get that period from Rosemary's Baby and, and uh, Night of the Living Dead through until 1982, between those years, 
you get this tremendous period of horror filmmaking. So I, I've often said to my students, almost any kind of iconic horror franchise you can think of has its origins there. You've got Halloween, of course. You've got Texas Chainsaw uh-huh. Massacre. You've got Last House on the Left. You've got Hills Have Eyes. You've got uh, Friday the 13th. You've got The Exorcist, of course, massive film. Um, you've got Alien. I mean, you just have this enormously, tremendously productive period. And then the end of that period, if I can just sort of it, it put a cap around the story, a lot of folks, and I, and I tend to agree, think you know John Carpenter made probably his most accomplished film, in 1982, the, the Thing, and everybody now looks at it and says, "Wow, that is a classic film. It's incredibly iconically influential. It's so dark. It's almost the perfect film of that era. Like it's it's great, gruesome effects. It's dark as sin. I mean, it's absolutely hor- really horrifyingly nihilistic film. And yet, audiences really did not go for it, and critics hated it. And partly because E.T. had come out just a few months before." So by the time you get to 1982, it's kind of Reagan's America. Like People want to be more positive. They want Sylvester Stallone as Rambo. They want E.T. as the happy alien. They don't want John Carpenter's disgusting mutated thing. right? But in the, yeah. in the years in between, you have this tremendous period of horror filmmaking uh, that really is, I would say, unrivaled in terms of the kind of creativity that's going on in the, in the horror genre. Yeah, and uh... – yeah, you, know, you uh, also uh, th- threw in Straw Dogs. I'm like, sure. Oh, okay, that's uh, uh, that's an interesting observation to in- include that movie. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Okay, it's not really you know, like your horror movie, like you know, with Freddy Krueger, but it's you know, still a it's like psychological drama. I mean, it is it is sort of classic. It's it, it, it for me, Straw Dogs, a little bit like Clockwork Orange, a little bit like Deliverance, straddle that line between yeah. kind of action, kind of thriller, suspense, kind of horror. And I've often thought, like yeah. particularly Straw Dogs or Deliverance, if you just nudge those a little bit towards the more gruesome. It, it becomes, you know, what some people call hillbilly horror, right? Where you're kind of like, uh, you know, regular person surrounded by crazy backwoods people. Whether it's, it's straw dogs, where there's crazy backwoods people are uh, British, or in Deliverance, where they're from the South. In either instance, you've kind of got this kind of like uh, city folks who don't belong here having to find a way through the horrors. Um, but both of those films, as well as Clockwork Orange. Um, kind of get out of being horror films because they're made by more established directors like Peckinpah and Kubrick, uh, and also because they they don't lean as far into the graphic horror. But I, for me, all those films uh, pick up that, and I would say as well, films like you know The Godfather, Apocalypse Now, which clearly are not horror films, but they're independent films. They're really pushing boundaries. Um, and they're films that would not have been made in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. And I would say, in fairness, they would not be made now, right? I mean, there was a particular moment where directors were given this kind of open, kind of carte blanche to say, sure, make whatever you want as long as it's interesting. And boy, you know, they certainly did in the 1970s. Yeah, well, and Straw Dogs has David Warner in it, so he... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that's uh, he. He can do just about anything. You know, he's great in time. The uh, you know de- devilish character in Time Bandits as well. One of my absolute but, favorite films, I must say. One of my absolute favorite films. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, part 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 of uh, you know my uh, like high school. <laughs> High school days, watch, watching you know some of those David Warner movies. He, he's uh, uh, the man with two brains too, but the, you know, starting to get a little too side <laughs> side track. But <laughs> but you know, I mean, but, Time Bandits is being remade. Taika Waititi is is in the process of remaking Time Bandits, so we're going to get a new version of our beloved uh, Terry Gilliam film soon. 
I did. I, I did not know that. Yeah, it's just that, that recently came out. There's been uh, some discussion about the casting and things, but uh, yeah, no, I'm with you. Time Bandits and, and, and yeah, David in particular, so dark and malevolent. But that film, if people have not, I would just say, if people have not seen that or have not seen it recently, go track down Time Bandits. Mark's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> And I also heard that uh, you know, since we're talking, you know, supposed to be talking about Kolchak, you know, we'll, we will get <laughs> back to that. But uh, uh, you know, since you, you know, you did talk about uh, you know, some of your guests on your shows uh, are talking about you know what people are doing in Hollywood or with new movies coming out. Uh, um, I, I heard that. Uh, Hellraiser was being remade as well. That is out, is that... actually, yes. There is a oh, new okay. version of Hellraiser that is out now. Uh, it features a female hell, uh, or uh, pinhead. Um, yeah, no, that's out, and that's getting a lot oh. of interesting press. So we're, we, I think, you know, again, to talk about if we look at the broader history of horror, I believe, and I've actually I've written this, so I suppose I have to I have to stand by at this point. Uh, we may be in a third golden age of horror because I do think what you're seeing happening not only uh, in the cinema theaters, but on the streaming services and on television is you know we are currently in a period where horror is not only really popular. But people are doing really interesting things with horror, you know. And I and I would note, like you know, the biggest films of the last several months have been horror films and low budget, like Barbarian, uh, and then Smile, and then recently The Halloween Ends, which is a you know slightly bigger budget film. Mm-hmm. Um, but those audiences are coming to the theater, which right now audiences are not really going to the theater for anything other than Marvel uh, superheroes. But but they are going to the theater. For horror movies, like so, horror is there, and 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 it's also, you know, as you point out, Mark, it's coming out in, you know, Netflix series like uh, Mike Flanagan's work on the Haunting of Hill House and Bly Manor, and now the Midnight Club. Um, it's coming out in the reboot of Hellraiser. You know, people are really drawn to horror at this moment, and it may be that we're in a moment where we're really in kind of a third golden age. Okay, that's a good point. And um, so, with the movies that you were just talking about, they were uh, you know, coming out in the late sixties. Um, you know, TV was you know, had kind of. It, you make a really good point that TV was um, already ha- had established the um, horror genre of, about ten years before uh, Koshak with uh, you know, the Adams Family and Monsters. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So, yeah, and uh, th- then you get a uh, night gallery thrown in there uh, right before the two uh, you know, Night Stalker TV movies. So can, can, can you give us a little background on you – know, just switch a little bit from the movies to the background on the TV at the time? No, absolutely, yeah. I mean you know, one of the things – in fact, I would say one of the things – pushing the motion picture make, you know, filmmakers to be more brutal and risky and taboo and, and transgressive was that television was a little more restricted. You know, television always had uh, the FCC. You know, television was seen as being part of uh, the public broadcast. Like, you know, it was the, it was the public airwaves. So you could uh-huh. regulate motion – you could re- regulate television – in ways you couldn't regulate regulate motion pictures. So when horror first comes into TV, it actually comes through radio. Uh, a lot of the popular kind of anthology series that have been on radio uh, kind of get transformed into um, almost like you know playhouse sort of things. Like tonight we're going to present you this 
scary short story, and they would they would present that on the television. Then, as you get into the kind of fifties and sixties, and then in the early part of the seventies, horror is kind of the twilight zone, but it's also uh, inserted into these kind of, as you point out, parodies of the sitcom. So here you have. Uh, the Adams Family and the Munsters are kind of the big iconic versions. Bewitched is a kind of another version of that. Um, so horror is in television. It's always kind of part of TV from the early days, but it's a very tame, uh, very limited version of horror. And then along comes particularly that first Kolchak uh, television movie, The Night Stalker, and boy, it blows the doors open. Yeah, uh, yeah, and you know, we also can't forget uh, the movie Psycho uh, because that, that's you know a direct connection to. Um, oh, Simon Oakland, absolutely. Yeah, uh, uh, you know Cole, uh, Cole and uh, yeah, the Twilight. Uh, he, he Simon was also in like uh, with two. Uh, Twilight Zone episodes, so, you know, we'll uh, get into that in a little bit. But where, um, since we were just looking at at TV, uh, okay, you have Dan Curtis and you know the you know Dark Shadows. So h- how is these ideas for the move, the two movies in the series, like starting to come together with, you know, what you call it, uh, Jeff Rice and, uh, you know, writing the book and you, know, you start, uh, you know, no one really knows each other yet, but how do they all start coming together to make such an, uh, fan favorites, uh, TV shows or series yeah i mean so it, it absolutely all starts with jeff rice right so he he becomes a little bit of the erased guy in this story um because you know he he has a interesting and difficult life um but so jeff rice is uh growing up in vegas uh he is seeing a lot of the way vegas operates he has a job for a while at a vegas newspaper um, and he comes up with the idea of writing a novel, and the novel is essentially what you see in the Night Stalker movie, that there are murders in Las Vegas, that a uh, newspaper reporter kind of gets the idea that this is an actual vampire uh, and then goes and pursues the vampire uh, to the resolution. Um, the novel doesn't get picked up. It kind of gets pitched to various publishers, doesn't get picked up, but at some point ends up on the desk of ABC producers. Um, and this is back, and this is, again, for younger uh, folks, they may not remember. There was a time uh, when, first of all, there were only three or four networks. That's the first big thing. Uh, but the other part was <laughs> those networks were fairly actively involved in producing TV movies. You know, so that I still remember the excitement of the ads for the ABC movie of the week because you were like, oh, what are they going to do next? You know, um, so the networks, uh, which are now very different kind of entities, but ABC, NBC, CBS were pretty actively involved in kind of developing material, not just for bad sitcoms. Um, so ABC picks this up and says, yeah, this would be a good thing because ABC was always a little more sci-fi horror kind of dark than the other two networks. So it kind of fit their profile. Uh, they bring it in. They bring in probably the best possible person uh, to turn that kind of initial novel into a very successful TV movie, uh, Richard Matheson. So uh, if po- folks don't immediately know that name, uh, Richard Matheson is, is probably one of the most influential horror science fiction writers uh, in American history, period. Uh, he wrote I Am Legend, uh, which be- later became a film with Will Smith, but was kind of filmed a couple of times. Um, he wrote uh, the, the Shrinking Man that became the movie The Incredible Shrinking Man, uh, so he wrote a lot of really great uh, short stories and novels. Duel. He also – Duel, exactly. Yeah, he wrote a lot for television. And that was, that was where Matheson was kind of an interestingly unique 
authorial voice in all this. He wrote novels that were proper, full-functioning literary novels. In fact, Stephen King would later say, um, if there were not Richard Matheson, there would not be Stephen King. Like, there's no way uh, Stephen King would have had the door opened if it weren't for Richard Matheson. Um, but Matheson also wrote, he wrote a lot for television movies. He wrote for Twilight Zone. He also wrote for shows like uh, Have Gun, Will Travel, which is kind of seems weird to me. But um, So Matheson comes in to be the screenwriter and then they bring in, I, to me, the other kind of really key behind-the-scenes creator uh, is a guy named Dan Curtis, right? And so, again, this is a name that probably most people have not heard of. Uh, Dan Curtis was actually a Syracuse University alum. I have to give props to my institution, uh, who went and actually started at his career in television making sports. And, and he actually sold a couple of very successful golf shows. Like this is a kind of weird – right? this is where you start and where you end up is very different. Um, he made some golf shows that were fairly popular like Celebrity Golf and various kind of golf shows and one day had a dream about a young woman on the coast of Maine in front of a gothic kind of creepy uh, uh, manor house and he immediately has this idea for a soap opera – uh, that he wants to call Dark Shadows, and that becomes, in the 1960s, a huge phenomenon, right? The first first season is mainly kind of vaguely gothic motifs. Uh, in the end of the, the – beginning of the second season, uh, they introduce a vampire, an actual vampire named Barnabas Collins. He takes off, and that show – for folks who have not heard of Dark Shadows, you should definitely track it down. It is – groundbreaking, mind-boggling daytime uh, television soap opera. Imagine, you know, General Hospital or Days of Our Lives with vampires, werewolves, alternative timelines, <laughs> H.P. Lovecraft, old gods. Like, it's just, like, completely insane. And so Dan Curtis is the guy behind that. Uh, and so Dan Curtis comes on uh, to produce Dark Shadows, uh, or to produce the Night Stalker movie, so you've got Jeff Rice's original script. You've got Matheson's kind of turning that into a very compelling TV uh, uh, screenplay. Dan Curtis comes on to direct uh, or to produce, and then you end up with um, this absolutely iconic actor, Darren McGavin, who probably is the center of gravity for all of Kolchak. I, I give Darren McGavin total credit for being the heart of the Kolchak franchise okay so uh, he darren's probably best known for you know that role uh, you know the kolshak role uh you know probably the dad in uh christmas story <laughs> but, right. but 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 what was uh what were uh, um, what were some of uh, Darren's roles prior to um, you know the early uh, being involved with the Night Stalker uh, movies in the early like what seventy two seventy three what uh, uh, was he in uh, Mister Roberts is that uh, what were um, some of his he, other movies? So he, yeah, he had he, his, Darren That's McGavin's sub- career was largely sub- in. He was in the Man with the Golden Arm. That was kind of the big one. The Court Martial of Billy uh, Mitchell. He was also in a, a, a very strange um, uh, Jerry Lewis film called The Delicate Delinquent. <laughs> so, uh, but Darren McGavin has had one. Some success in Korea. Yeah, that definitely is a missable one. Um, he had some fair success in uh, motion pictures, but really, uh, for the vast majority of folks, his career was in television. And to me, what's interesting is one of his very first roles, uh, he came in and starred for two seasons in a show called Casey Crime Photographer, uh, where he played a crime fighting crime photographer who worked for a newspaper. Uh, and to me, that kind of solidified what I think were for audiences in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, kind of Darren McGavin's kind of core role. He was often that 70s 
cynical, tough-talking detective. Uh, in the late 50s, he starred in Mickey Spillane's Mike Hammer. Again, some folks might not remember, but Mike Hammer was kind of your quintessential hard, tough-talking detective, you know, the think your classic film noir, you know, the kind of mm-hmm. voiceover actor. Um, he was also I love in those. a show called The Defenders. He was in um, a number of them, right? In fact, not that long before he was uh, in uh, The Night Stalker, he had appeared in another kind of short-lived show, uh, called The Outsider, where he had appeared as, again, a kind of tough-talking detective. Uh, but he kind of appeared in a lot of these roles across his TV career. So the idea of Darren McGavin being a little cynical, a little world-weary, but also kind of determined to get to the truth for audiences of TV, that was Darren McGavin. And so that was absolutely the perfect cast. Okay, so... So as the ideas start developing for the TV movies, um, you know, where do we st- start getting the uh, seersucker suit and uh, crafting the role of Carl? I mean, I think – so, I mean, again, I think as with all things in particularly television or film, it's a collaborative effort. So, you know, Jeff Rice definitely deserved the credit uh, for coming up. You know, he, he would later say he had based the character partly on an actual t- uh, newspaper reporter he knew in Vegas. So there's, there's clearly a kernel of real person there. Um, and Richard Matheson writing it, Dan Curtis, of course – kind of orchestrating all this, figuring out how to make it work for television. But I still say the look, the feel, the attitude of Carl Kolschak is Darren McGavin. There's a great story that um, the original screenplay was going to have Carl wearing Hawaiian shirts and light pants because that's what a newspaper reporter in very, very hot, uh, Las Vegas in the 70s was wearing. That was the kind of standard uniform of the kind of more informal, relaxed Las Vegas newspaper reporter. But Darren McGavin remembered a line in the script where Carl Kolschak is talking about having been a reporter in New York City. And so Darren really locked onto this idea that Carl Kolschak was a New York City reporter on the edge of big success, you know, kind of New York Times, Wall Street Journal kind of a success, who had, for whatever set of reasons, fallen on a hard time and ended up in Las Vegas. Now, I should say I have nothing against Las Vegas, but uh, clearly the Las Vegas newspaper scene is not quite the New York. And so for Darren McGavin, the heart of Carl Kolschak, and actually you see this throughout not only the TV movies but later uh, the series, the heart of Carl Kolschak is an ambition not just to get to the truth, but to get back, right, to get back to the New York Times, to the potential for a a Pulitzer Prize. Like he has this kind of driving ambition. And so Darren McGavin asked what were ambitious newspaper reporters in New York wearing in the late 1960s, and they were wearing seersucker suits. And so Darren McGavin decided that is what Carl would still be wearing. It's almost like, you know, you always have those friends of yours who are still, like, wearing their high school letter jacket or still wearing, you know, the jean jacket, right? You know, they're still wearing their hair like they did in the 1970s. You want to go like, hey, no offense, but the world – right. So they're still latched on to that, uh, you know, that golden age when they were cool. Darren McGavin realized that was Carl. Carl still wanted to be that young, ambitious reporter even as he was getting older and older. So, again, all of that feel for Carl Kolschak, I think ultimately everybody deserves some credit, but Darren McGavin is really the heart of that character. (laughs) Yeah, and you you do um, note that 
Carl is um, a product of the uh, his character is a a product of the times as well where he's a contrast to uh, Woodward and Bernstein yeah I mean to me I think it's really important to think about you know because one of the things you know, this is kind of a I like what I, I, I like what you said. It, it, it said that it, it's you know it, it, a very relevant uh, point you make. Yeah, I mean, I think you know one of the things that is really influential about this, the TV movies and later the series, is that the Cold Shack uh, Night Stalker franchise. Uh, shifts the horror narrative from the monster or the victim to the gothic investigator, right? This, 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 this monster hunter, which was not particularly prominent prior to uh, the Kolchak movies and then the, the TV series. So the idea that we would follow the monster hunter was, was relatively new. And, and, and to your point, Mark, and I think you're exactly right, there are lots of people that might hunt monsters. Like certainly the police might do it. Later, of course, we know, uh, you know, uh, Chris Carter would say, let's transport the idea of Carl Kolschak and instead make him an FBI agent and we get the X-Files. But in the 1970s, this is the era where, let's be honest, the police were a little bit suspect because we'd seen what the police had done to civil rights. Uh, protesters. We'd seen the Democratic National Convention in 1968. Um, the whole country was a little bit anxious about uh, police authority and military authority. Again, this is the the era of the kind of end of Vietnam. So this is you know this is not a particularly uh, patriotic rally around the flag period. But the people that were heroes were newspaper reporters. They're the folks that broke the Pentagon Papers. Uh, they would later be the folks that broke the Watergate story. And mm-hmm. so I feel like Carl Kolschak as a kind of hero of truth and the American way, uh, it makes a lot of sense for him to be a newspaper reporter because those are the people that would do anything to get to the bottom of the story. Yeah, and I like uh, what you were just saying about uh, monster hunters like uh, uh, Scully and uh, – Mulder, uh, you, know, you can also say that uh, uh, Van Helsing was a monster hunter too. No, absolutely. No, I think that there's a, definitely a long lineage of monster hunters. But what's interesting <laughs> about like Van Helsing is Van Helsing is a character in Dracula story. Like, mm-hmm. With with the Night Stalker, we sh- we flip the script right so that it's it's not. Janos Gorzny's story, it's actually Carl's story. And so then we stay with him. And I think that's the brilliance of Jeff Rice's novel. Uh, it's the brilliance of the Matheson screenplay. It's the brilliance of that first Night Stalker movie that it takes this very traditional story of a vampire and a vampire hunter, but it tells it from the point of view of the vampire hunter. That's what really changes changes the cultural narrative. And yeah, you know, just to uh, work in another uh, Rod Serling, uh, Koshak connection. Uh, you, know, you get the music opening up with. Uh, you know the Night Stalker, and, and it's like the same same uh, composer did the you know really bizarre music for um, uh, the Night Gallery. Uh, what? How, how was uh, what was his name? Uh, Gil, Gil Malay uh, yep. brought yeah. in, and yeah, uh, the uh, you place a lot of importance on. The introductory music. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of not only the introductory music, but the beginning of Night Stalker. Again, uh, the TV show in particular. Yeah. For folks who haven't seen it, you should go on YouTube. You can find a, an easy clip of it. But what what I love about that opening is it captures 
musically and visually, I would say kind of the heart of the idea of the Gothic, which is, you know, so at its root, this whole idea of Gothic, whether it's Gothic fiction or whatever, is that there are kind of two worlds. There's the world of day that you and I live in where everything's kind of normal and, you know, the streets work and the stop signs work and the world kind of operates. But then there's also this underworld, like this nocturnal world, this world where things are different. I mean, probably the best example for younger folks is uh, the, the Netflix series Stranger Things. You know, so there's, there's our world and there's the, the, the upside down, the underworld, right, the, the, the other side. And so that theme, as well as the opening of, of uh, the Kolchak TV series, really captures that. It kind of has this kind of light, happy, silly, whistling, happy, you know, sort of theme song. And then at some point it suddenly breaks and it's heavy strings and it's dark and it's, it's intense. And that is what the Kolchak series, I think ultimately what made it work was its ability to kind of balance those two things. You know, again, for folks who haven't seen it, uh, the Kolchak series was at times very, very funny, uh, especially, you know, when, when uh, Simon Oakland and Darren McGavin's characters were going at each other. Like, there's just some amazing comedic moments that you can't help but Yeah, their weekly arguments. The, absolute, the weekly argument of, like, why Carl is insane to think it's a vampire or a werewolf, as, as much as you'd think at some point someone should have said, hey, maybe Carl is right. Um, but But – Added to that is there's always going to be the darker element, right? You know, there's always going to be the more frightening element. And so that theme from Gil Malay really captures those two sides of the world that really made uh, the, the cold shack, the two TV movies work, and then ultimately the series work. Yeah, I, yeah, it, yeah, well, uh, you know, get get into the social media uh, s- stuff in a little bit, but uh, you know, pe- you know, people uh, in you know the uh, Night Stalker s- social media groups, uh, you know, about midnight on Saturday nights, you know, they're, they're posting the whistling has started. <laughs> So yeah. yeah, it's like oh okay, better better run to the uh, TV. But yeah, that's that's all. You know, they need to say, and you know, for those you know, like me who grew up watching it, uh, and I continue to watch it as often as I can. And you know, a lot a lot of the uh, shows are on uh, YouTube as well. Um, it, it you know. There's just something about that the music, uh, easy going music that quickly becomes uh, has a sinister feel to it, and then it uh, becomes dark, uh, darker, and then the clock stops. Um, It's I think it's a really powerful, um, like a, a opening to a show. No, it is, and I think it really captures. You know, because I think you're exactly right. I think it really captures what Night Stalker did, uh, particularly for horror television and horror. Right? You know, so the, the 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 narratives of horror on television. Because if you go back to even you know before that theme song, right, to the original 1972 Night Stalker movie and again for folks who maybe aren't as familiar this was for many years the most watched tv movie in history it was staggeringly successful like over you know half the televisions in america were watching this movie so this is you know staggeringly successful um but what night stalker did which i think the theme song kind of captures is it takes all that creepy, gothic, monstrous otherness that was typically, you know, either in Transylvania in the 19th century uh, or it was seen as in outer space, 
and it brought it into everyday life, and it did that through television, which was always much more restricted. Like television was always a much safer place. And again, for younger viewers, that might seem mm-hmm. strange in the age of you know AMC's Walking Dead and uh, all the things on Netflix and HBO, et cetera, et cetera. But there was a time when network broadcast television was relatively safe. And so Carl comes in and brings probably as frightening and dangerous and unpleasant a kind of narrative as you could bring, right? Um, And so the TV show, I think, you know, the TV series was always a little less shocking or gruesome than the two TV movies, but it retained that idea that you were coming in and it might seem like a happy kind of sitcom-y, light, whistly theme song, but at some point that darker current is going to come up and get you, and that's what made the Night Stalker really work. Yeah, and you know, I think you could take that same idea about you know, the music helps to make the show work and you get the same thing with uh the X Files uh, and mm. yeah, it's like a little bit of a variation on the uh, uh close encounters type uh uh song uh it, you know way to c- communicate with the uh spaceships at uh you know Devil's Tower but you, you know you know, uh you know, besides Chris Carter writing uh, one of the episodes, you, you, know, you also get the stop time, which is covered in um, yeah. the X Files. So yeah, you, know, you see so many things. You know, these little things that you, know, you bring up in your book that uh, you're like, oh wow, it, it, you know, there's like a, a homage. You know, twenty some years later from the X Files and Darren being in it. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, this is the thing. I, I'd say, particularly for for anyone who's listening who is not already a Carl Kolshak fan, or who may be saying, "What is? What do you mean by Kolshak, and why does this matter?" Um, it is absolutely the case. I mean, demonstrably the case that TV shows, uh, particularly in the '90s, which was kind of the era of the rise of horror TV that I think is is still kind of happening today, but the shows like Twin Peaks, um, Uh the show, certainly the X-Files, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayer, uh, later Supernatural, uh, Friday the 13th, the series, these shows would not have happened if it were not for the Night Stalker. So while the Night Stalker was, um, ultimately unsuccessful as a TV show. I mean, I think we have to acknowledge, at least from the industry side, it ran 20 episodes. It never really had particularly great ratings. I mean, it had okay ratings and then really not very good ratings. It ended its season tied for 64th, so it was not uh, burning up uh, the uh, dial. Uh, the TV series was never as successful as the two TV movies. Um, but still... The, the story stayed with audiences, right? People remembered it. And when it was uh-huh. rebroadcast, and I often say this, I, I think actually probably the real key for Kolshak becoming such a part of the cultural imagination, like just our kind of broad understanding of the, the imaginary world, Kolshak becomes really crucial. I think not only by its initial airing in 74 and 75, Uh, on ABC, but really it's rebroadcast in reruns in the 79 into the 80s on CBS Late Night TV. Because that, I mean, to be honest, I'm a little bit younger, so that's where I saw it. And I think when you Mm -hmm. look at like folks like Chris Carter and Eric Kripke, who are probably about that age, my guess is a lot of them saw Kolshak on that late, late night kind of reruns. And that was the defining moment. Like people saw that and said, Hey, I can make that or T V executives and again the T V executives in A B C who would later kind of greenlight uh David Lynch uh to make Twin Peaks, 
they would say, we want to recapture that Night Stalker feel. We want a TV series that's compelling and dark and gothic, just like Carl was. And that is why that door gets opened for all those series in the 1990s that open up, you know, kind of horror television. And that's why we, today, that's why we have Walking Dead and Discovery of Witches and American Horror Story. All that comes, I think, from Carl. Yeah, and you know, pr- probably uh, uh, what we do in the shadows has yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, 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 that that shows uh, hilarious, but you, you get that uh, you know the wh- horrors. Uh, you know, but but there's also a lot of comedy with the inept vampires, and it's it's, it's all uh, closely related. One of one of my favorite shows, absolutely. Taika Waititi and, and uh, Jermaine Clement. It's, uh, absolutely, people have not seen that. They have to track that. Uh, probably a little more on the Munster side of things because it is pretty hilarious. Um, uh-huh. But no, I, you know, I, and I think we really are in a great age for television horror. I mean, almost every streaming service has some variation. You know, whether it's Stranger Things, it's a little more kid, or what we do in the shadows, which is absolutely hilarious. Or American Horror Story, and it's a little bit more graphic. Or you know, pick your pick your poison there. I don't think any of these exist the way they are currently if it were not for those original TV movies and that Polshak series that ran from seventy four to seventy five. Yeah, <laughs> and, and speaking of uh, you know, some of those. Uh, yeah, uh, h- hilarious moments with G- Guillermo and <laughs> uh, Nantor. Uh, yeah, there, yeah, there are some you know really f- uh, funny moments with uh, you know between Carl and Tony and Carl and. Uh, Ron, the uh, you know various police chiefs of Chicago <laughs> who uh, don't like Carl asking uh, questions. They they seem to know something, and his, his questioning seems to r- really trigger the police chiefs. Uh, you know, let's get into some of the like comic uh, element. It's like. Uh, it, you know, you know, you know, I started the uh, show talking about, you know, I was watching it when it was premiering or, or de- you know, the shows were debuting and I, I, I don't know, it was like seven or eight and um, I just, you know, you know, been a fan for like 50 years, but you know, when I've gone gone out to do you know concerts or you know my uh, out to do uh, research, I don't have like a, a little camera like Carl does, but um, you know, I do uh, have my uh, camera case. I don't have a, a recorder, but. Um, it, yeah, I'm when I'm uh, going to an archaeological site to uh, you know write about it. You know, basically investigating like Carl. That's always in the back of my mind. Um, you, know, uh, you know, Barbara t- thinks I'm a slob <laughs> uh, like Carl. She's like, how can you find anything? And, on your desk and you got all the, all these other papers, um, <laughs> like, so, so, like in a semicircle or, or around the, no, I wouldn't say you were a slob. I would say you were a master at chaos. <laughs> Barbara chimes in. <laughs> yeah. She, but yeah, yeah. Barbara's by Tony. But, but yeah, the, the, yeah, the, the, no. but it, it, it it is a funny interaction where. Remember who signs your, Mark, remember who signs your paycheck. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting involved okay. in this, Mark. You're on your okay. own, buddy. Okay. okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Well. Get, uh, get back. I, I think you know my question was something about the, the interactions with uh, you know the other characters in the office and you know all, at the crime scenes. Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right. Uh, the the comedic relationships, I believe, are you know simultaneously kind of help to keep the horror from being too much but also probably make the series uh, palatable uh, for television. The initial movie had a lot of that, but I will say, for me at least, and, and some folks might disagree, but when I look back at the original Night Stalker movie, that was the one that was you know, hugely successful in, back in 1972, um, the, the only recurring cast members are Tony, the Simon Oakland, and Carl, Darren McGavin, uh, and they have a lot of battles, you know, no surprise, Tony's the editor, uh, Carl is the reporter. They have a lot of fights over, uh, you know, reporting, uh, printing a story about the killer potentially being a vampire. You can imagine that might be a little bit controversial. Um, but it's, it's a very, it's a much um, harsher comedy, like it, 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 they're much darker, it's much more macabre. As the series develops, I feel like, you know, and I think this is part of, moving the narrative to network television series, uh, there are more characters and the comedy is a little bit lighter and a little bit more pronounced. So you have, clearly you keep having, you know, Carl and Tony battling over whether Carl can print a story that a, a Senate candidate is actually a satanic worshiper who turns into a dog, right? Which is clearly not probably going to make most uh, Chicago <laughs> newspapers. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, you've got Ron Updike, who uh, Carl calls Uptight, uh, who is your very, you know, the, op the exact opposite of Carl. If Carl is like you, Mark, a little disheveled, mm -hmm. a little disorganized, his desk has got piles of stuff. Updike is always in a three piece suit. He always looks immaculate. He knows all the right people. Uh, so you can imagine, for folks who have not watched the series, um, Carl and, and Ron Updike have a lot of uh, kind of run ins. There's also the wonderful Miss Emily, who's this sort of uh, septuagenarian, kind of elderly woman who writes the advice column, is also writing a, a romance novel about the sex life of elderly people. Uh, so, you know, Carl, by the time you get to the series, you have this kind of bigger cast of characters, uh, including, as you point out, uh, some of these uh, police chiefs uh, who are always. Uh, irritated by Carl, ready to, to run him in. And I would say, you know, there, <laughs> in addition to the comedic aspect, it's also worth recalling, you know, again, this is the, the mid-1970s, and so the police are not a universally good thing as they would have been in the 50s. So the fact that Carl is always kind of running contrary to the police, uh, it probably fits in with the broader kind of culture. Uh, but again, there's some great, there's Keenan Wynn uh, who played uh, one of the only recurring kind of police chiefs, uh, Mad Dog, uh, Siska, uh, who's this kind of over the top, angry Chicago police captain. Uh, he's great in that comedic role. So a lot of it is, you know, if Carl's not engaging in battle with monsters, He's engaging in comedic battle with his colleagues at the INS newspaper or with the police. But it kind of keeps uh, the horror and the comedy kind of balanced, which is kind of the key to making the series work. Yeah, uh, Keenan uh, has he, – he and his dad have uh, Rod Serling connections. That's right, Ed, Ed, Ed Wynn and Keenan. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know the Kubrick connection with uh, you're going to have to answer to the Coca Cola Company in Doctor uh, right. uh, Strange, <laughs> Strange Love. <laughs> but yeah, yeah uh, Keenan was in, um, or, or both of them were in um, the um, Playhouse ninety. A requiem for heavyweight. That's exactly right. That which was Rod. Uh, uh, exactly uh, right. uh, uh, there was uh, uh, there was um, the man in the funny suit. Both were in that. 
as yeah, then yeah, yeah, that's right. Ed, that's true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Then Ed, Ed was in um, uh, uh, one for the Angels. Uh, uh, that was the second Twilight Zone episode. Yeah, I, I also thought you know part of it was, and certainly Rod Serling is, is, is his own amazing genius. But I think one of the things that Dan Curtis brought to the Kolchak franchise, although in fairness, Dan Curtis was involved in producing the first movie, he did not direct it. He directed and produced the second movie, and then he was out. Right, so ABC when they moved to series, Dan Curtis was kind of left behind. But one of the things I think that was kind of in the DNA of Dan Curtis was to look for those established TV movie character actors, right? To always look for folks who TV audiences could immediately see and immediately know who they were, right? You just sort of have those characters. You sort of say, I've seen that person before. I know what kind of character they are. And that kind of stayed with the series. And I really think Keenan Wynn uh, was exactly that kind of character. Like the minute you see him as... Uh, Mad Dog Siska, you kind of immediately are drawn back to all the other great performances he's been part of. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, you know, you're just uh, yeah. I didn't you know realize it until you know I read your uh, uh, Koshak book that um, yeah you know, the series was uh really uh, a pioneer in uh bringing cultural issues to the front like you know you were talking about uh you know the, in the uh you know 50s you know cops were seen as the good guys by the 70s uh you know they didn't have a good reputation. Um, mm. You know, you get into a, 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 like how many of these uh, cultural issues were going on. Uh, you know, like the monsters were uh, from uh, different uh, cultural backgrounds. You know, uh, that's you know was fairly unique. You, know, you might get a little bit of that from like Star Trek, but. Um, you know, for a mainstream uh, uh, TV, or, you know, like it, it, it wasn't set in outer space. The <laughs> no, right. uh, yeah, monsters and are are you know, drawn from a lot of folklore. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, Carl in the Night Stalker, it was very much aimed at a lot of the anxieties of America in the 1970s, and part of it was. You know, anxieties about authority. So there's lots of episodes that are about, you know, maybe we can't trust the government. Maybe they are doing things with androids uh, that are not uh, a good idea, or science is maybe not as progressive as, as we think it is, and a little bit dangerous. Um, but also, as you point out, this kind of engagement with multiple cultures. And for me, the episode that is kind of like a really great highlight of that is, um, again, one of my favorite episodes, uh, Horror in the Heights where we mm-hmm. have a, a series of, of kind of gruesome murders occurring, uh, we see because of some really terrifying monster. It's in a very Jewish uh, neighborhood in Chicago. Uh, we later find there are all these swastikas, so it seems like, okay, we have a clear villain. It's, it's some sort of neo-Nazi monster. Uh, but then it ends up being a, a, a monster from Hindu legend in India, which is actually where the, the kind of swastika as an image uh, originates. Uh, and it becomes this kind of interesting multicultural mix. It's Jewish culture and Indian Hindu culture mixed in Chicago, and there's Carl in the middle of that. And I think a lot of what the show had was you know, kind of Carl navigating. And, and certainly that was also the case in terms of like gender politics. You know, We had a lot of strong female characters. Um, some people have suggested we have one of the first kind of lesbian couples um, from uh, the show called The Ripper, uh, where we have a, a, a stripper – uh, who has a kind of very large female uh, friend, uh, but that was probably fairly clearly coded as a lesbian relationship. Uh, obviously not explicit, because you know clearly they're not going to say that uh, on American television in the 1970s. But Kolchak was really kind of engaging with 
1970s America, which was a real period of transformation. I mean, again, people can forget this was the period of Watergate. It was the period of Roe versus Wade, which, of course, has, has been overturned, sadly. Uh, but it was that period of Roe versus Wade, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, the civil rights movement. I mean, 1970s America was a lot about transformation. And Carl and the Night Stalker TV show didn't shun away from that. And they didn't – and what I, what I, I would just say this – what I really admire about the show is they didn't turn those politics or those differences into monsters. It would have been very easy to make a very reactionary show where all the other people were scary and the normal white people were, were the safe ones, but Kolshak didn't do that. Like Kolshak was willing to find monsters in all kinds of places and to go in all kinds of directions – and so it really was an exploration of what America was in the 1970s. Yeah, you know, like um, you know, you know, appreciate the point that you, know, you make about um, distinguishing between the like Victorian Gothic and you know during the series, the you know just the 20 episodes. Uh, the monsters are uh, not relegated to just the castle uh, or uh, Whitby Abbey or you know, so, some place like that. It's just uh, next door. Uh, uh, you know, Jack the Ripper was living next door to uh, you know, the person who would become Miss Emily. Yeah, I mean, I, and, I, and I think, you know, to me, again, I think one of the – so I, to me, there are two really crucial things that the Kolshak franchise or, you know, the TV movies and, and the, the series do that transform the way we think about horror on television. One was that gothic investigator, you know, that we're focusing not on the monster's family like in Bewitched or the monsters, and we're not focused on a victim. We're focused on the investigator. But the other was taking – gothic traditional horror and bringing it into the real world. And so for me, the, 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 the kind of quintessential moment of that is that 1972 Night Stalker movie where you have a vampire in Las Vegas feeding on victims. Okay, fine. That's a traditional gothic Victorian idea. But if a vampire were actually feeding on people in 1970s Las Vegas, they would leave victims and bodies. They would have autopsies. There would be police with uh, press conferences about the death. The vampire would have to rent a car. The vampire would have to have a house. Right? All these kind of very mundane elements, and those become really crucial to the plot of the narrative of the Night Stalker. And as the series progresses, uh, you, know, you have the 1972 movie, you have a 1973 movie, which again, some people forget, but it's actually a, a really great film called The Night Strangler, uh, featuring a kind of Civil War era doctor who figures out the key to immortality, uh, is murdering people every 23 years, uh, so he kind of keeps reemerging. Uh, but then when you move to the series, you keep that idea, let's bring a wolf man or let's bring a zombie or let's bring a vampire into the real world and deal with what that would actually look like, you know, which is not castles and uh, uh, manors and foggy moors, but it is police and uh, reality and uh, press conferences and autopsies. And that I think was a great way for the TV show to kind of bridge the gap between very safe traditional American 1960s television and the much more uh, transgressive, radical things going on uh, in, in, on movie screens in the 1970s. And so Kolshak kind of managed to bridge those by bringing real-life horror into television by kind of framing it in this gothic way. So it, it, it's a really brilliant series. Yeah, I and... You know, like yeah, the you know, there's some pros and cons to ha having you know the monster of the week, but it worked. It, it's not the same same thing show after show, um, and, and you know, even with the X Files, 
you have uh, you know, a lot of uh, episodes dealing with um, uh, UFOs, but uh, you know, there's uh, you know like the uh, Peacock family with um, you know all, all the inbred uh, kids and uh, all, all types of other monsters. So it, it, yeah, you can see that legacy being developed you know, 20, 25 years later. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, the Monster of the Week aspect, and so this is, you know, for folks who, who maybe are not as familiar with the series, uh, when you move into the series, it really does become uh, every week there's a different kind of monster. You know, one week it's Jack the Ripper, who's immortal, and the next week it's a Haitian zombie, and the next week it's a werewolf on a cruise ship, and then it's a alien, invisible alien, of course, because, you know, special effects cost money. So it's an invisible alien, and then it's a Hindu <laughs> monster, and then it's, a, you know, it's Satan. Spanish and boss monster. It, it's a Spanish boss monster, which is clearly, you know, you're, you're reaching the bottom of the barrel when you get to the Spanish boss monster, although that's one of my favorite episodes. But, um, yeah, mine yeah, too. But the monster of the week... The one the monster of the week works in some ways. So it, the monster of the week episode kind of framework works in that you're always something different. It's always something interesting. And I would say, and I'll agree completely, the monster of the week framework works very well when the series returns in the late seventies, eighties as reruns. So if you go back and look at when CBS was rerunning the series in its late night, which is again where I where I saw it, I think I think a fair number of people uh, first encountered the series. Um, they never showed the series in order, and they never showed all of the series. So Kolchak, because it was Monster of the Week, really works in that fragmented rerun framework, right? Because it's like you don't need to know what happened before or after, et cetera, et cetera. But I will say I think one of the problems of the series, and again, as much as I love the series and I, and I love as much as all the other fans do, so I'm not being critical of our beloved Carl Kolschak, but it has to be said uh, that the series never really uh, developed a lot of ratings. It never really built its audience. I, I will stand by. I think one of the reasons is that – the series never developed a bigger narrative arc, right? I mean, the X-Files would later be really great. So as you point out, Mark, you know, the X-Files was great at including one-off episodes um, of, you know, mutant hillbillies or, you know, demonic possession or whatever it might be. But there was still everything, there was still a bigger arc of the truth is out there, the conspiracy, um, and you know, I'll just say this really quickly. I've seen some people sort of responding to some of my other kind of interviews online uh, saying, oh, well, that was part of 1970s television. Well, it is true that the 70s was often very episodic, but people should not forget The Fugitive, uh, which is a very popular long-running series in the yeah. 1960s, uh, was mm -hmm. episodic. I mean, it was clearly like, you know, he sort of showed up in different towns and with different problems, but he was always looking for the one-armed man. Like, that was the core, you know, kind of key quest of the series. There was an earlier series uh, that was just a little bit before the Kolshak series called The Invaders. That was about an alien invasion that had a kind of core central motif. Um, and in fairness, not that long after Kolshak uh, was off the air, uh, we had sci-fi series like Battlestar Galactica that did have a very clear through line. So I do think, you know, one of the things that Kolshak didn't do, um, that I, you know, this is not speculation, I know later TV uh, uh, showrunners would learn from was we love having a Monster of the Week, but we got to create this kind of serial tension across at least a season, if not a series. Um, the X-Files were great at that. I think Supernatural was great at that. Buffy the Vampire Slayer was great at that. They learned the lesson of saying, sure, you want a variety. You don't want every week to be a soap opera where you're constantly building on the same narrative over and over and over again, but you still have to have some through line. 
uh, that connects episodes. And the Coal Shack series never quite developed that through line. Well, it was probably perfected by the X Files. And yeah, undoubtedly, that X Files and Twin Peaks were probably the the, the series. Uh, you know, Twin Peaks was a little bit singular and focused on you know the the, the death of Laura Palmer, uh, but the X Files. Like you're exactly right. The X Files was the, the the great example of balance. And again, you see, the X Files lasted you know multiple years. I mean, it was a very successful mm-hmm. series for a long time. Came back, then came, came back. back the movie, yeah, it came back and came back and came back. Right. Um, Kolchak didn't have that. And I think one of the things, you know, I think we agree on that Kolshak was missing was that bigger st- – again, I was just say for me as, you know, in, in terms of like writing this book, returning to the series, having loved it as a child, um, what I lo- – there are a lot of things I loved about it. But the one thing that was frustrating was that Carl never seemed to learn uh, and nobody else did either. So even though Carl identified a vampire in Vegas – and an immortal Civil War doctor in Seattle, uh, and uh, uh, Jack the Ripper, and all these other things. Tony still never believed Carl, and I kept thinking, how can you not at least entertain the idea? You've seen this, like you've seen this over and over again. So that, you know, I think at least for modern viewers, and I think that period of the '70s was kind of the pivot. I think there was a little bit of frustration of, well, why doesn't this build to something? And that was maybe what the series was lacking. Look, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the Paramount Fay was one of your favorite uh, monsters, and you know, touched on the Rakshasa. Uh, you know, what are your some of your other favorites? monsters from the series well i mean i I will say this i i I will challenge anyone to disagree but to me i think the single most terrifying episode of the series uh was the zombies uh and the moment where carl is in the abandoned car in the uh uh, junkyard yeah yeah yeah, trying to trying to put the salt in the mouth of the zombie and sew it up that is even now that like gives me heart palpitations. So that is absolutely one of my favorite. Um, I you know I really admired. Uh, I loved the, the Mr. Ring. I thought that was really uh-huh. interesting in that the there was a level of sympathy that I think probably was not always the case uh, for monsters at that time. Um, I'm really I love the Devil's Platform, which is the uh, Senate candidate who has made a deal with Satan, partly because I think the episode came out just a couple of weeks after Nixon resigned. So I think when Carl says uh, this is Satan trying to get all the way to the White House, it probably resonated with audiences more uh, in 1974 (laughs) than it does now. Um, There, yeah, I think there were so many episodes that were super creative, Um, and again, the, the, the series had a pretty impressive writing room. I mean, you had a lot of folks, including probably most famously David Chase, who would later develop The Sopranos, um, you know, involved in the writing. But they clearly were, you know, pushing pushing the boundaries of kind of what could be included in this kind of monster. Now, so Mark, do you have a particular favor? Um, the Rakshasa with the. Yeah. Surprise ending, and, and, and you know, like I think a lot of people overlook uh, Miss Emily. Like you know, you know, you did talk about Tony and Ron were always in arguments, but um, Miss Emily se- seems like she always uh, kept Carl. Uh, in line. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. She she was about and you know we uh, never see d- during the show or the series uh, 
we don't know where Carl lives. Um, no, or, or anybody about his family. And he, he yeah, there yeah. Some jokes about his brother working in various places, but that I I feel those are fairly clearly jokes. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's interesting but, that he we never there's never a love interest after the two movies. There's no more love interest. Uh, there's no more family. There's no domestic life. Miss Emily is kind of his only stable yeah. friend, I guess. And Tony, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think the uh, uh, Rakshasa one is you know, my uh, my favorite, and it, then you get the uh, joke about the you know the, this was the time when the uh, cult of Kali flowered. Yeah, you know, it just it, it's one of the worst <laughs> jokes, but it's, but it. it 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 just it's perfect for that series. But no, it's, uh, it's and, a very uh, great ABC television humor. <laughs> but I also like the uh, the um um what was the one with the uh, the the Trevi uh, collection? Is, is that the one with the the uh, mannequins that are, are moving? Absolutely no. The TV, uh, and, and, I remember the child weird. being terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that one's uh, pretty freaky, e- even though it's all done with yeah, you know, uh, qu- quick cuts. Um, it, it, yeah, that's that's like one of those. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, what you, uh, editing moments that. Uh, really makes a big impact on you, you know, like the shower scene in Psycho. No, absolutely, yeah. The, the, those those manic, I think those seeing those mannequins moving probably traumatized more people than uh, than most other aspects of tele- yeah. network television in the seventies. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, uh, you know what? Yeah, there's. So, so many. Uh, oh, what, oh, which ones? Are, um, there was the. Does uh, bad medicine have a? Uh, you know, Carl's driving to a crime scene in December, and he has the top down, and you get the trees in Chicago, that are right. yeah, it's sh- Chicago, and the trees are all green. Um, I've never been to Chicago, but I seriously doubt that that's how Chicago looks in December. I have spent a lot of time in Chicago, and absolutely, you are not having the top <laughs> down in December without some sort of like nuclear holocaust moment. No, it, it's freezing from you know September on. So no, it, it, it's a, yeah, they clearly were it, not. Overly concerned about you know narrative fidelity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah then you get uh, uh, in you know, the uh, early scenes of Bad Medicine, the uh, 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 like native guy turns into a uh, uh, wolf that runs up the stairs and he turns back into. Like the uh, native uh, chief again, and he, uh, he uh, Carl stops to uh, take a photo of you know so supposedly the uh, dead police dog that the wolf just attacked, and you can see the dog's ears twitching. It, 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 <laughs> it, it's it's one of those things where you know, you're expecting to see the zipper on the back of the you know wolf man. Uh, costume, yes. but it, 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 you know the century uh, probably yeah, the worst, could, probably the low point. Yeah, it, it, yeah, you could tell just someone in like a uh, bl- blow up uh, costume. It, it's almost like one of those you know balls. Uh, uh, where the you know, people uh, run and bounce into each other, you know, it's probably something like <laughs> yeah. that. But it, it, it's uh, 
you know, uh, you know, Chopper ha- has his, you know, it's probably some uh, guy wearing football uh, shoulder pads to uh, elongate uh, the upper torso so you can get the uh, spine sticking out. And it, it's just so, some of the monsters are just, so terrible to see. Yeah, it's like, oh my gosh! I, yeah, I, it, <laughs> yeah. The makeup is so bad when you, you, you see it when you're, you know, thirty or something like that. But you know, when you're like seven, eight years old, it, it's like so cool. It's like, yeah, you, know, you don't see all that. How uh, you know, cheesy the monsters are. No, I, it's funny you mentioned Chopper. I, I remember being absolutely terrified. By mm-hmm. Chopper uh, as, <laughs> as a young kid, and, and, and thinking, oh my God, that was such a graphic depiction of a headless motorcycle. So, for the folks who haven't seen it, you know, Chopper is basically uh, Sleepy Hollow, the, leg, the headless horseman, except the headless horseman is now a motorcycle rider, which makes perfect sense. Um, but watching it again now in my 50s, uh, yeah, it was. Painfully awful special effects, <laughs> but it, it it's you know j- just one of those aspects of the show that um, it, it, it uh, makes it endearing yeah. to fans. And I think you're I mean I think you're absolutely right for folks now. And I think there is absolutely, and you've alluded to it already, this incredibly loyal, rabid fan base, which I consider myself part of. And I also say that fan base who are really you know, mainly centered on social media, some amazing Facebook groups, um, they have been super supportive of me uh, and this project and answered a lot of questions. And I write about them a little bit at the end of the book. Um, they, you're exactly right. They take every bad special effect, weird line, uh, and it becomes absolutely endearing. So I, I you know, it, it is, if you love Carl and you love the nice stalker, you're going to love him for the really scary scene with the zombie, but you're also going to have to love him for the really bad lizard effect of the century or the invisible alien <laughs> and they are, they shall be, they shall always be. Um, you have to, you just have to take all of it as a leap of faith and know that this is a great, great series. Yeah. And, and you, know, you do have uh, so many people on the uh, Kolshak Facebook page where, you know, they're taking selfies outside of the INS window. I, I you know, see, see that about once a week. Oh, uh, yeah, that that's actually a real building. That's right. That's right. It's st- still there. Uh, uh, you know, you, in some of the episodes, you can see the uh, uh, train uh, going by the window, and then you know, focuses in uh, after the train passes. It focuses in on. Uh, the independent news service uh, uh, window, and you know, there's uh, then it cuts to the interior shot, and you know Tony's eating his anti-acid <laughs> pills, waiting for Carl to come in, and Carl has some kind of excuse about why the story's not done, but. <laughs> But you know where? Uh, like, do, do you know the name of the uh, like platform stop where uh, or the train station uh, where you know people are taking those photos? It's right there on the T or the, on the L there in uh, Chicago. It's right on Dearborn Street, but I, I don't recall the exact number name of the stop. But it's, it's right there on Dearborn Street, uh, which is part of the kind of central part of, of Chicago. But it absolutely has become a kind of iconic um, spot, and I think largely because of the Night Soccer. And it, it's you know again right there in the middle of downtown Chicago. And I also think you know I think that's that's another 
point that maybe people don't always acknowledge is the importance of Chicago, right? New York has always been, you know, especially in the 1970s, New York was kind of the, you know, den of iniquity and this kind of, you know, rotting pit. Uh, Los Angeles was always the bright, sunny future, but Chicago was always that middle ground, right? You know, it was, it was the one big American city, certainly in the 1970s, that was neither fully East Coast nor fully Midwest, nor fully West Coast. And so for me, setting uh, the Night Stalker in Chicago was a really vital aspect of seeing it as this kind of gothic middle. I mean, as we talked about earlier, you know, with the theme song, it's kind of there's the world of day and the world of night. Well, I think in America's you know, kind of cultural imaginary, L.A. was always the world of day, and certainly in the 1970s, New York was the world of night. I mean, this is the era of, you know, the warriors and uh, escape from New York and, uh, you know, President Ford telling New York to go to hell, right? I mean, so you know, New York City was kind of the uh-huh. pit of falling American sort of disaster. And so Chicago's right there in the middle, and that's where Carl is. And there on Dearborn uh, Street is, is the, the heart of that, which is the INS offices. So I think the, the geography of all that kind of gothic America in the 1970s was really crucial to the way the film, uh, the way the, the series developed. Okay. What, um, yeah, you know, we're just under 30 minutes left. And I also want to uh, talk about, uh, you know, your, um, Dark directors' uh, books. What um, Romero is? Uh, yeah, a lot of his movies were filmed. You know, you know, within like sixty, seventy miles of me. Yeah. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, you know, fairly uh, local film celebrity. Um, you, what what drew you to um, R- Romero, Carpenter, and Craven? Yeah, I mean, I, I I will say, you know, I've been interested in horror for for quite some time, and um, the the first kind of big project I did was kind of looking at the the broad history of horror from the kind of first time. Films are called horror films in 1931 with Dracula and Frankenstein up until the beginning of the 21st century. So it was, it was a book called Projected Fears um, that looked at the kind of history of horror from 1931 to 1999, so like the, that, that period. Uh, mm-hmm. And in, in writing that book, I, I was kind of aware that there was that period that we talked about earlier, that kind of second golden age um, – in the 60s and 70s when, you know, horror really went off the rails and people were kind of going in all kinds of crazy directions. And one of the key points was that it wasn't just that, you know, the industry standards were open or that censorship was relaxed, but what was really crucial to that period of the late 60s and 70s, that kind of second of golden age of horror, was that there were filmmakers – who were taking up this question of horror and really pushing it in unique directions. And so for that book, um, Dark Directions, uh, what I wanted to look at were essentially who are the architects? Like who are the people who built the blueprint for modern American horror? And undoubtedly, you know, the first, as, as I said, as much as, you know, Roman Polanski's uh, Rosemary's Baby was an influential film – Roman Polanski then went off and did whatever else Roman Polanski did. Um, but George Romero, who made Night of the Living Dead, George Romero stayed in horror. Like George Romero built his career around making films that made us uncomfortable. So Romero was kind of the first foundational pillar. Uh, the other that, again, I think sometimes people forget, uh, even though he's probably the most successful of those directors, was Wes Craven. Um, who, again, most people know probably from Nightmare on Elm, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, right. But 
earlier, well before Nightmare on Elm Street, had made like one of the most disturbing films of the 1970s, uh, Last House on the Left. He'd made The Hills Have Eyes. He would have success in the 80s with Nightmare on Elm Street. He would come back in the 90s with Scream. I mean, he was you know really consistently successful at uh, kind of making American horror uh, meaningful. And then the third of those big directors, to me at least, uh, in sort of reshaping the American vision of horror uh, was John Carpenter. And, and undoubtedly, you know, Halloween is clearly a, a film that has redefined the very conception of horror uh, to the point where we keep having new directors remaking <laughs> Halloween over and over and over again. Uh, but it's also, you know, John Carpenter's work in films like The Fog and uh, uh, Escape from New York, and then later films like uh, Prince of Darkness, which is one of my absolute favorites. Uh, favorite. So for me, uh, Dark Direction as a, the book and the project was about saying, what were the visions of these, particularly these three directors, who really redefined the notion of horror and kind of relayed the foundation that I think even today. So, you know, when I go watch a movie like Barbarian or Smile, um, I'm seeing Wes Craven. I'm seeing George Romero. I'm seeing John Carpenter. And so I want to think about how those directors kind of rebuilt the formula for American horror. Yeah, it, um, yeah, did, uh, didn't John Carpenter uh, direct uh, They Live? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of my favorite films. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one, yeah, that one is just being uh, cited all the time, you know, with surveillance and obey and you know th- th- things, you know, little segments from that movie. I, I, I yeah. yeah, that one just uh, really seemed to. Foreshadow uh, you know, surve- the surveillance state, you know, fact checkers, and you know, all, all that kind of stuff. You know, who, who's really uh, 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 in control of are allowed to see. So it, it, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, you know, you see that one uh, quote all the time. It, 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 uh, that one just really, maybe, uh, maybe uh, ha- has that might be the most influential of all of his movies. I, you know, Halloween's kind of uh, would have to be yeah number one or a close second to They Live, but yeah, you know, both of those are just. Uh, very well respected movies. No, I mean I would say you know of all of I mean, yeah, I think I love all three of them. So I I can't really get into a contest of which one I love more, but I do I definitely think you know John Carpenter has had a long career and he's continued to push the boundaries of what we think of as horror. And so I you know I absolutely love they live I'm actually a super fan of uh, one of his films. It was kind of a lesser-known film called Prince of Darkness. Um, absolutely adore that film. Just, just think that's a film that, that should get a lot more love. Um, but, you know, again, you know, Romero, throughout his career, kept making films that were just dead center aimed at the hypocrisies of American culture, whether it was race relations in Night of the Living Dead or our desperate pursuit of, you know, kind of consumerism in, in Dawn of the Dead uh, or yep. even, you know, post, post 9-11 America in Land of the Dead. Um, Romero was just, he was like a, a, a crack marksman of, of sort of seeing America's hypocrisy and hitting it with his horror films. So that uh, to me, all three of them were just pivotal for laying the foundation for folks like now, like we have Jordan Peele, who's consistently making films that really are, you know, horror films that are like really hitting America's, you know, kind of where we are now or Ari Aster or Nia DaCosta or others. So I feel like, you know, all three of those filmmakers 
built a foundation to make horror not just interesting and fun, but make horror relevant. And I think that's that's mm-hmm. really that's what kind of what the 1970s was doing. Yeah, the, um, you know when we were, uh, you know, to, talking about, uh, you know, this show, you know, it said that there there's a, uh, uh, like zombie museum at the Century Three Mall and. Monroeville, um, maybe there could be a all expense paid paid uh, field trip by nightlight uh, up to that at some point to vi- visit that museum. But uh, yeah, you also said there was a art, uh, Romero archive in Pittsburgh. I, I That's wasn't right. aware at the of University that of, At the University of Pittsburgh, uh, they actually, uh, some amazing folks uh, uh, there at the University of Pittsburgh have uh, received the uh, George Romero uh, papers. Uh, and so I know my good friend Adam Lowenstein, who's a professor there in the Department of English, uh, is one of the people, Ben Rubin is another person who's there in the library. Uh, they have developed this kind of George Romero archive. Uh, and they're kind of building this kind of horror studies archive. So um, they're very fortunate. The University of Pittsburgh is one of the kind of epicenters of the study of horror, and, and they're doing amazing work there at Pittsburgh. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that uh, that sounds really uh, very interesting. So when you get the uh, when you get the uh, nightlight uh, funded uh, visit there, let me know, and I, <laughs> I would like to be funded to go there too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe maybe I could. Uh... <laughs> that brings Barbara back on. I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. At least we know she's still out there. Uh, you know, <laughs> I only have about – make it through about another 16 more minutes uh, uh, unless she cuts me off early. But um, <laughs> but um, you know, and, you know, um, and Barbara also said that uh, you know, one of her uh, – you know, the most scariest movies for her is Silence of the Lambs. Mm. And... Yeah, so it's, it, that's one of the big ones. I, when I wrote that, for me, the kind of first book about horror uh, was a film. It was a book called Projected Fears. Uh, as I said, it was kind of like tracing the history of horror. And and um, you know, Silence was one of those really pivotal films. It's kind of some people say, oh, that's not a horror film. Um, but I think the people who say it's not a horror film are people that say they don't like horror films. It is clearly, you know. Uh, super influential in the genre because it focused very much on this kind of procedural aspect and this kind of like kind of more realistic serial killer film. So silence really redefined. I think it kind of picked up the uh, narrative of the slasher genre of the 70s, so back to Halloween or uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, but tried – in, in, in a way, very similar to what Kolshak did in The Night Stalker, um, Silence took those mythic slasher films and grounded them in reality. So it was not just that Buffalo Bill was out killing people, but it was that if, if there was a person like Buffalo Bill killing people, there would be an FBI profiler searching. So in some ways, I do think Clarice Starling is very much an ancestor of Carl Kolshak. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, that makes sense. Oh, I see what you're saying there. And in your other books, do you, do you uh, touch on uh, the silent movies? Yeah. So I mean, I, so I was in a nutshell. The history of my writing books uh, is usually driven by guilt. So I, I so I. <laughs> So I write a book, and then I feel bad that what I didn't write. So I wrote, again, that first book, Projected Fears, and 
it was a history of like major films that influenced the history of horror. So it was the films like Dracula, The Thing for Another World, Psycho, Silence of the Lambs, Halloween, etc. And immediately after writing the book, I felt bad that I had not focused as much on directors who had helped shape the genre. So I wrote the Dark Directions book that was about Romero, Craven, and Carpenter. And after that, I thought, you know, the other thing I felt bad about was that in writing that first book, I started with Dracula, which was, you know, kind of the first kind of uh, talky uh, sound Uh era horror film. But I essentially kind of dismissed everything that had happened before. And this was the, the, the particular – so I wrote a book called A Place of Darkness, uh, The Rhetoric of Horror in Early American Cinema, um, to deal with those films that I would call like were pre-horror films or films with horrific elements. So these are films like – and again, some horror fans will know these titles um, – Cabin of Dr. Caligari or Nosferatu mm-hmm. or Phantom of the Opera – or Haxon, a lot of people love the Benjamin Christensen film, Haxon. None of those films were talked about as horror films. Like they were not, that language was not in the vernacular. That was not part of the industry discourse until Dracula and Frankenstein. But undoubtedly, you know, Nosferatu, which was a, 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 actually an illegal uh, adaptation of Dracula, so illegal that it was actually. Um, pursued by Bram Stoker's widow, uh, who sort of filed cease and desist orders wherever Nosferatu was uh, 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 exhibited. Um, so these, these these films were clearly horror films, and indeed the the, the several adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, there was a 1910 adaptation of Frankenstein. So there were lots of films using what we will later think of as horror but we're not talked about as horror. So I wanted to think about um, and research what those films were doing, um, what would, how are they understood prior to the idea that you could call them horror films. And so the, the, the little book, A Place of Darkness, was all about saying what was horror in film before we had the term horror film. And then, you know, hopefully there's some things there that are interesting to folks. Yeah, uh, uh, what was the uh, Haxon film? I've, I've never heard of that one. That's, oh, you should check this out. It's a fascinating film. Um, it's a silent era film. Uh, Benjamin Christensen, which, who is a Danish filmmaker, um, he made this film in uh, 1922, so a little bit after uh, Caligari. Um, it's called a uh, kind of history of witchcraft, uh, and in English it was often uh, translated as the witches. Um, it has some of the most, um, I would call it, disturbing imagery of uh, silent era horror films, uh, but it presents itself kind of as a documentary kind of recreation of uh, witchcraft oh. in Europe in the mid- Middle Ages. Um, it, well, I will just say this. Uh, I think it's very interesting. You should definitely check it out. Um, it did not get a lot of play in the United States. Like uh, People did not particularly go for it. It was a little bit weird. Um, but it did launch Benjamin Christensen, who would later end up in Hollywood. Uh, he would make a number of films, including one of my absolute favorite silent era horror films, a film called Seven Foot Prince to Satan, which I think is probably the greatest title of all films. Like period. Like if you, if you, all film, you know, the greatest title of all was Seven Footprints to Satan. Um, that is a just completely bizarre American Hollywood film. And after that came out and people did not go for it, uh, Christensen went back to Denmark, which is probably the wise choice. But, uh, but yeah, but Haxon or The Witch or The Witches uh, is a fascinating uh, exploration of kind of early silent film um, horror, and I think it's it's got some great imagery, so I would definitely check that out. Okay, I, I, I wasn't aware of that one. I I I, I do enjoy those um, uh, silent movies, uh, like you know Doctor Caligari and 
uh, Fritz Lang's you know, se- several Fritz Lang's uh, silent movies you know, mm-hmm. with uh, Metropolis uh, being you know, just one of my all time favorite movies. But uh, you know, it, it, you know the, those silent movies are, are uh, actually really interesting to watch. Uh, Murnau's uh, you know, uh, he has other. Uh, Really uh, captivating movies, other than uh, Nosferatu. Um, you know, there's uh, you, know, you might be able to get in, you know, to kind of classifying uh, Houdini's silent movies as almost being horror type movies. I have to, no, absolutely. I think you know, Houdini's early stuff was clearly kind of in that vein of the kind of yeah. pre-silent, you know, the kind of pre-horror silent era. I think the other place where, you know, again, folks who maybe really want to dive deep into the history of horror, uh, the other place where you really find fascinating kind of horror narratives that, that are in, in, in many ways precursors to uh television series like Kolchak are the silent era serials. And so up into the 20s, the the serials that were like the perils of Pauline, that were these, you know, short, uh, for the folks who don't know, serials were often like short episodic films that were shown over a long period of time. So if you if you went to your local movie theater, you would go each week to see the next ep- the, the next edition. So it was like TV before there was TV. Um, but a lot of those early serials in the teens and 20s uh, were horror-related. I mean, there were like satanic cults, there were monsters, there were aliens, there were monsters. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was quite a fascinating period. Um, and I feel like those, in many ways, were the bridge between Murnau's films, you know, like Metropolis, et cetera, and uh, moving into films like, uh, or to, you know, the television series like Culture. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's, I think that it, the 20s had um, a renaissance the uh, uh the get to it, it, it there there's a lot of really neat stuff uh mm-hmm. coming out of there it, it, you know hundred years later it doesn't really uh, appeal to a lot of people but i i you know you can find a lot of them uh, on youtube just sit, sit there and watch them uh i i think it's actually uh uh, shows that the directors were actually, you know, really creative with this new artwork, yeah. you know, art art medium, and yeah, you know, there's you know, like the uh, one of the Houdini ones was uh, he he was what f- frozen in a block of ice and somehow he got out of out of it on some shipwreck. I forget what uh, what that was. Uh, called uh, I saw it on YouTube. So it's probably still there, but uh, yeah, there's just a, uh, a lot of neat stuff coming out of that time period. Well, it was it was really the development of motion picture language. I mean, it was really you know mo- you know motion pictures start in the late 1890s, 1895, and so you had mm-hmm. this kind of initial period where it's kind of a novelty about 1905 to 1910 it sort of solidifies it's starting to become a thing but really it you know it takes another decade from 1910 to about 1920 for it to develop into a kind of stable like you know what a motion picture is going to be for me that, that period those first years are really strange and exciting because People are sort of taking motion picture technology and saying, what can we film? We can film uh, 
a factory, we can film a train, we can film a microscopic process. Like people are like, just like it's exciting to film whatever we can get, whatever we can find to film. But as you get into the twenties, people really started to push the boundaries of storytelling. And so your point is mm-hmm. exactly right. You know that you 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 get filmmakers like you know, Houdini, uh, Murnau, Lang, uh, others who are starting to say, what can we do with this medium? How can we tell stories? How can we push boundaries? And that's the foundation. And particularly as you get to the late 20s, um, you get these kind of genre foundations of the Western, the action, the melodrama, even the horror film that will start to develop. And then clearly when you add you know, talk technology or synchronized sound technology in the, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, then it emerges. So it's, it's, it's like uh, you're kind of the initial building blocks are in the 1920s. So folks who have not spent time in the silent era, I really encourage you, go back, look at those films in the teens, in the aughts, in the 20s. There's some amazingly creative folks doing amazing stuff. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, I think probably a lot of them are now available for free on uh, YouTube, and I've seen s- several there. I I I'm, I I I agree with you on you know highly recommending that them. I I I uh, ha- have always enjoyed them, uh, and you know, kind of we're down to I don't know, two and a half minutes or so. Um, <laughs> you know, let's uh, give give you a chance to plug where you can get your, uh, your books. And I think you were a fantastic guest and, you know, the invitation still is there for you to return. Well, I'm, I'm glad the invitation was not rescinded. That would have been like a really yeah. embarrassing. If two hours later you said, actually in retrospect, don't ever come back. Um, no, I'm Mark. <laughs> it's been amazing. I, I've really enjoyed the conversation. You're, you're an incredible uh, host. I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. To folks out there, Thank I you. definitely would say if you love Cole Shack, I, I, I always say this, I'll just say this. I always say if you love Cole Shack, the definitive book is Mark DeWitt's X. A companion to the Night Stalker, uh, which I believe is actually coming out in a little while in a new edition, and I've heard that from Mark. Um, and mm-hmm. Mark is, for those who don't know, Mark Dwidziak is the preeminent historian of Kolshak. He is the probably the most Columbo. knowledgeable person. Columbo. I would say 1970s television in general. So uh, uh, I bow to the uh, throne of Mark Dwidziak. I am not here he, to try to usurp that great. throne. He is he is amazing and, and a really uh, gracious and generous person. Indeed, as you are, as, as are you, Mark, a really, really gracious, uh, supportive person. My little effort on Cole Shack, which you can find at Wayne State University Press, which is actually, uh, I think, on a discount for the rest of the month of October. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, my little book on Cole Shack, the Night Stalker, is not meant to be the preeminent definitive history. It's really just meant to be essentially a kind of argument to say Kolshak should be in TV history. Like people should not overlook this series. They should not forget about it. And so my goal in that book was just to say, um, don't overlook this TV series because it really did reshape the very nature of horror in our popular culture. And so um, if you love Kolshak and you want, or I would say if you love Kolshak and you need to explain to someone else why you love Kolshak, Maybe my little book will be helpful, so please track it down. It, it, it's a terrific book. Th- thank you, Kendall. And uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, you know, Barbara has a show. I think Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Talk talk to you soon. <laughs>